Let's talk about why fake news is total BS. Everybody's lying almost all the time. There are very few people, honest people. There, there are very few honest people in the world, and I have no faith in humanity. Because first, we have a story right here. It says why every social media site is a dumpster fire. Tribalism makes these platforms easy targets for con artists. This came out uh, today, just this morning. Not actually about an hour before I'm filming this. I'm filming this early because I'm about to get on a plane. But I have to say, Vox. I really appreciate this. And this is why, if you watched my last video, I said Vox isn't that bad. They do a lot of, there's a lot of things I think are wrong. Absolutely. But they're on the, like, I would put Vox in a position of, they're, a, they're like left of something like the Wall Street Journal. They're on par with, the, actually, I, I would say they're actually a little bit better than Huffington Post. They're partisan like the Huffington Post, but they're more factually accurate. And I, I respect this story right here for one reason. The story that's going around from you know, Ezra Klein posted this. He's a founder of Vice. I'm sorry, a founder of Vox. And I think it was wrong of him to do. He posted this alternative influencer network. I've talked about it a lot because I'm in it. They're smearing me, lying about me, alleging I have connections to people I've never, uh, never even met uh, or interacted with. And they're also claiming, and this is the best part, that some of the connections on the graph are because I was at a VidCon party. I kid you not. I was at a party at VidCon where I met Bunty King and because other people, someone, uh, uh, Sargon filmed a video for like an hour, and because you, I'm in it, and then I leave, they said, boom, that proves Tim is connected to these other people. And I'm like, dude, I never met those people. Like, I walked into an, a, a, a building at a YouTube convention. Heaven forbid a study found out that YouTubers went to a party at a YouTube convention. It's the darndest thing. It's so weird, isn't it? But the problem with that study, there's a lot of problems with that study. For one, they lie about me. But they also make it seem like this problem of algorithmic filter bubbles only exists in certain areas. What she has actually done is selectively chosen a bunch of people and then talked about how they have sometimes talked to each other. In one instance, she claims that I've interacted with James Alsop simply because while I was in Portland, James Alsop walked up to me and asked me some questions. Seriously. And she actually omitted a bunch of people who did, and I don't want to name anybody because I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but she omitted several people who are absolutely collaborator, like they collaborate with many of these different people who are in this network or whatever. So it was all very selective. And the problem, so what I want to bring up here is this Vox story. They recognize that every social media site is a dumpster fire. There are a bunch of different bubbles on YouTube. You can, you can, you can see the filter bubble by looking at related channels. And then what happens is by clicking through related channels, you can see how this network extends. Ultimately, the network extends to literally every single person on YouTube possible. However, some connections are stronger than others via the algorithm. So let's, let's take a look at what they say. The past few months have brought a hurricane of horror stories about social media sites gone haywire. Facebook and Instagram hijacked by Russian trolls. YouTube struggling to find an army of conspiracy theorists. What is this? Oh, it's The Verge. Uh, Twitter become, coming to terms with its own fake news problem. Even Pinterest isn't safe from misuse by bad actors. And nearly every story is ended the same way, with the owners of the platforms apologizing and pledging to do better. But the problem with these social media sites isn't that a few bad apples are ruining the fun. It's that they're designed to reward bad apples. Yes, 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 yes. Literally. Okay? I have had conversations with Google where I've asked them, why don't you specifically intertwine your algorithmic bubbles? When you have, so, so the network that I'm a part of, it includes like uh, uh, V and Styx and Sargon and other people for one reason. We talk about similar things that are in the news, period. That's really it. My, my take on many of these stories is dramatically different from many of these other people. But because we talk about similar things some of the time, YouTube puts us in the same area and wants other people to watch us. This is rooted in something simple. If you're a fan of League of Legends, YouTube wants to show you as much League of Legends as possible. If there are political YouTubers who talk about certain issues, whether or not they agree or disagree or oppose or hate each other, they're talking about similar things and YouTube says these are topics you should hear about. Sometimes, within this network, you have people like me who say things like diversity is a strength and made a whole video about why Tucker Carlson was wrong. Yet for some reason, now because of the algorithm, it's a, I'm accused that somehow that radicalizes people. If you're going to hear my personal opinion and my personally, I believe, well-reasoned arguments as to why I support certain ideas, you're absolutely allowed to disagree with them, but I don't think that can make things worse for people. But this is what the bubbles do. And so I've actually been looking at some of these bubbles, and I can see that there are external bubbles. Groups like the Young Turks, David Pakman, Kyle Kalinske, they're in a different bubble 
where their viewers are all like pretty liberal and, and you know, far left. And you can see that they make comments that are as inflammatory as the people who make comments on my, my videos. You know, there's a dude who comments on like every single video I make saying progressivism uh, poisons everything. That kind of comment, I think it's funny. It's kind of like an inside joke at this point, but it's, it's, it's a mirror image of what you would see on something like the Young Turks. But we talk, ab so actually this is really interesting too, because the Young Turks and I do talk about a lot of the same issues, but I believe it's probably metadata related as to why our channels are kept separate. I don't think it's a grand conspiracy, but what ends up happening is it does reward bad apples. Within the algorithm of YouTube and these problems, there are people who they make a video and then they get a response. They see that it works and they say, hey, I'm gonna do this again. You end up with people who don't believe anything they're saying. They're just chasing the algorithm because it's working and they're making money. And then you have a lot of people, in my opinion, who just have opinions that people like watching. I'll tell you why I think my second channel is doing so well and why my main channel has done moderately well over the past year. It's been about a year and a half and I've gained almost 200,000 subscribers on my main channel. It's been two months and I have gained something like 60 uh, or 55,000 or more. I think it's almost 60,000 subscribers on my second channel. My second channel is growing way faster for one reason. It's not because I'm a bad apple. It's not because I'm chasing the algorithm. It's because whatever I'm doing f fit perfectly into place in the, in the YouTube algorithm. What ends up happening is there are many people who naturally rise up. PewDiePie is a really good example of someone whose content was perfect for the YouTube algorithm. He didn't do it on purpose. It just happened. He's a guy, he make, you know, imagine that you have a hundred people, they all make content. It's all different. The algorithm underneath will naturally just hit whoever did it right. And that person will get promoted. That's what happens. However, there are people who exploit this and there are some rather famous people who have rather famously exploited this and become extremely famous. I don't want to name them because I don't want to get sued, but let's just say that they're some of the biggest YouTube channels ever. They're considered to be very nasty people. Some of them are considered to be pretty cool people, but they have famously explained how they, they figured out what was working in the algorithm and exploited it and continued to do so. And those are the bad apples. The bad apples aren't the small channels who just talk about what they like and happen to do well sometimes. It's the massive channels who know exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it, and they're doing it to manipulate, to gain power, right? But this group is rather small. So in 2016, it was, uh, well, let's, let's go up here. Social media sites are built to cater to the base preferences and desires of their users. They figure out what information people like and then show them more of it. That's a great way to keep people online, but it also makes these platforms prime targets for con artists. People are naturally drawn to inflammatory and sensational news stories, regardless of whether they're true. So bad actors, conspiracy theorists, trolls, and fake news writers have been tremendously successful in using these platforms to spread false and divisive content that exploits people's tribal instincts. This is what needed to be written about in that AIN thing. They should have removed all of the names they put in it because that was just a smear job. And they could have said specifically, this affects everyone. No matter who you are, no matter what you believe, you have been shoved in a bubble and people have been begging Google to do something about it and they won't. I think there's a solution. I think one of the solutions for YouTube would be to purposefully intertwine unrelated channels uh, algorithmically. So take a look at um, David Pakman, for instance. It's pretty easy to see that his channel is a political channel. It's a news channel. How about for YouTube, instead of censoring certain channels and complaining that things have gone too far, all you do is if there is a channel that's a conservative in the recommended section on the right of their channel, you include three uh, similarly structured channels in, this, in the same genre that tend to use totally unrelated tags. I'm not talking about balance of bias. I'm talking about David Pakman covers a lot of different stories that I don't personally uh, cover, right? He's, he made a video talking about Beto O'Rourke and Ted Cruz. Okay. I don't, I, I don't really cover a lot of electoral politics. I do mention the midterm sometimes, but I'm not doing a hard look into that. That means we have two channels that are political commentary, news related, that are separate from each other. Here's my idea. All you got to do is put them together, right? So on my channel, say you like maybe like something like you should, you would also be interested in, or you can balance your view, but David Peckman doesn't necessarily have differing opinions to me on a lot of issues. So we're not opposed for the most part in a lot of our policies. We just don't talk about enough of the same things. And I think it would be really great if they crossed the algorithms over on purpose. So yes, for the most part, you still get served content you like, but a certain, a certain percentage of that will be within the same genre, but an external bubble within that filter. You know, I've talked to Google, Google about this for years. Don't think they're going to do it. I don't know why, but then you end up with these AIN things saying like these people should be banned because they feed radicalism. And it's like, that's just not true. 
You've just isolated some people who happen to have talked to each other at some point, and that's ridiculous, right? And, and the other thing too about the, the AIN stuff is that, this is my favorite part, AIN, Alternative Influencer Network, these people have uh, communicated, they're, they're networked to extremism. You know, during the, the, the study period, I interviewed someone from Mike.com. Uh, I interviewed people that have appeared on mainstream news. I've interviewed, uh, I interviewed a guy from freepress.net. Are those people adjacent to white supremacists? That's ridiculous what they've done, what they said. So let's take a look at the, uh, they, they made a video about it, but I'm not going to watch the video. They said, so far, social media sites have promised to crack down on individuals, individual bad actors who repeatedly violate the community guidelines. But punishing individual actors doesn't change the incentive structures that brought those actors to the platform in the first place. As long as con artists can use the platform to prey on people's most base desires, social media sites will continue to reflect the worst of human nature back at us. I agree. I don't believe the answer is censorship. A lot of people, like, you know, the AIM woman said, we, they, they should look at not what people are saying, but who they're hosting and things of that nature. And what she gets wrong is, for one, if I have a guest on my channel who violates the community guidelines by saying racist things, I, I get a strike, right? It doesn't matter who is on my channel saying it. It just matters that something was broken. She's wrong about that. She also says that they should look into the size of channels and their influence when, when dealing with guidelines. That, that's literally a side effect. Alex Jones was banned and he's not the worst offender. It's just that he's so large, he generated a ton of scrutiny and they went after him, okay? So what she asserts is totally wrong. Uh, but what I think the solution is not censorship. I think getting rid of Alex Jones was a huge mistake. I think, you know what they could have done? And I, I bet Alex Jones wouldn't have had a big problem with it necessarily is on the right side of his channel where it says you'll like these channels too. If, if there was something saying like, you know, uh, check out these channels too. And it connected to similar news programs that run, run counter to uh, Alex Jones. Let me just say this. I absolutely and wholly encourage and welcome con, you know, uh, conflicting narratives to appear on my channel. I want and encourage that. I think it would be absolutely beautiful if on my channel, it didn't say Sargon V Sticks, it said the Young Turks, Vox, BuzzFeed, and then Sticks, Sargon, and V, right? I welcome people to in, in consume as much media as possible to try and balance out their views. My views stem from mostly on Twitter. I follow around 600, I believe it's 667 accounts right now that are relatively balanced between left and right and alternative and mainstream. And so I have Newsweek and the Daily Beast and Huffington Post and Vox and a bunch of left-leaning and even far-left sources like Antifa sources. And then I have right-wing ones too. And so I see a mix of the information. I try to do my best. Not perfect. I can't see everything. I can only do what I can do. But I understand these problems and I'm personally trying to fix them. How we get people to fix them themselves, don't know if we can. But maybe these platforms can look at how their algorithms form bubbles, and then just have lines cast out between those bubbles so that people can easily trend, you know, uh, traverse between various filter bubbles. I don't know. Let me know what you think. I'm going to get out of here. I got to hop on a plane. Thanks for hanging out. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 4 p.m.